Hey, good morning out there. My name is LaRue Fitch, educational consultant here from Chicago, Illinois. Listen, this is Breaking the Education Code. Do me a huge favor before we get started. Just go ahead and click that share button. I'm only going to give you guys 20 seconds, okay? So click that share button before we get started. All right, so let's get right into it. Again, my name is LaRue Fitch, educational consultant from Chicago, Illinois. I want to say happy Saturday, okay? Happy Saturday morning. I hope everyone's having a blessed and fulfilled Saturday morning. I have not been here in a while, okay? So I'm just really pumped and excited. And I woke up this morning on 10, okay, because I was going to have this conversation with you guys, which is going to be beneficial, okay? Um, we're going to talk about instructional strategies um, around the process of argumentative writing and how you can utilize that within your capacity. Before we get started, just do me a favor. Become a member of Black Educators Rock. Go to blackeducatorsrot.org. Again, go to blackeducatorsrot.org and become a member today. If you're a part of Facebook, okay, because a lot of my listeners are on Facebook, you can join your local chapter, okay? I oversee the Illinois chapter here, so you can go to Black Educators Rock hyphen whatever state you're part of and i promise you we have a chapter there if not become a member so you can start your own chapter again you want to become a member of black educators org. we have a global consulting um service that's out here that's supporting schools across the districts you know across the whole state of you know united states of america we are here to support you remotely and once this pandemic is lifted we'll promise you we'll be there um with in-service support so please go to black educators or listen, this was the first week of school for a lot of my um, um, listeners out there, especially the ones that work here in the Chicago land area, as known as Chicago public schools. So this whole remote learning has been something, right? And you know, I have this conversation jokingly with a lot of my family members, just how I'm working in the midst of remote learning. I'm working collaboratively with you know other. Um, other individuals out there that are educators as well as working with my sons I have my third grader that's more independently but want to give a huge shout out to a lot of my parents out there that's working with kindergarten first grade second grade I feel you <laughs> I feel you as well as our teachers out there you have to be a phenomenal educator to instruct scholars that are kindergarten first and second I'm telling you and especially when we talk about this remote learning just the simple things right Click that button, Josiah. Pull out your whiteboard, Josiah. Pull out your clay doh Josiah. Pull out, I mean, all of this. You know, I just said this jokingly. My son needs a one-on-one. What you're talking about working with kindergartners in this remote learning is not the same. So I do appreciate his teacher. I appreciate all you teachers that are going far beyond because just to keep the attention of a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old is really, really difficult. So again, thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Keep striving for success. I promise you we're going to overcome this. This is unforeseen circumstances currently right now, but you guys are phenomenal out there and we'll make it work. So let's get right into today's topic of discussion argumentative writing. So I promise you it's going to be worth the listening to click that share button, right? Add this to the teachers as well as our parents, because I'm telling you, our parents out there need to ensure that they are working collaboratively with the teachers to understand the specific areas in which I am um, talking to you about this morning. Have your pencil, notebook, paper out there, and let's get right into it. As a kid growing up, in pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, intermediate, right, middle school. I remember back in the days, okay? I'm not that old, but I, I can say back in the days, um, we worked on three forms of writing, okay? We worked on expository, we worked on persuasive, and we worked on narrative writing, okay? You know, expository writing was you explaining something. Just explain it. They gave you a rubric and you just explained it, right, in a structured way. OK, think about that. Then we talked about persuasive writing. You have to persuade the individual to buy something like an ad, right? A television ad. OK, how can you persuade someone to buy your goods and services? And last but not least, narrating a story. And I grew up on the foundation of those three. And I said to myself, like, man, it has to be a different way. I promise you guys out there that are listening. It was not until the implementation of the Common Core State Standards, I will say that I was introduced to 
textual evidence claim right and then a couple years from that someone gave me a book and they gave me a book about you know from doug fisher the gradual release of responsibility and then i was introduced to the writing process of argumentative and i was like wow this is phenomenal right because when you look at the common core state standards okay not only do you have ela and not only do you have the mathematics standards that are umbrella under there you also have language and acquisitions, but more importantly, out of those standards, you have speaking, you have listening. So when you look at different rubrics, different forms that they are using to evaluate you or to give you feedback to coach you and build your capacity, I'm talking to teachers out there in regard to your administration that's supporting you in that, you want to make sure you understand a rubric in its totality. So when I was able to diagnose the rubric, break it down, analyze it, I put it all in perspective. I said, listen, if I'm able to relinquish responsibility back to my scholars and they take academic ownership, they're able to debate, they're able to find the claim, they're able to have the evidence, the backing, the warrant, the rebuttal, man, I'm doing my job and I'm facilitating the learning environment and they're doing it in a respectful way. That's argumentative writing, okay? So I want you guys to understand this. Argument of argumentative writing is the most rigorous. I'm going to say the most. I didn't put that in my talking points, but it's the most rigorous and one of the best summative assessments, right? We have a lot of scholars out there that, that can benefit from argumentative writing. It welcomes diversity, right, in your classroom. And we always say public education is the cornerstone of democracy. And we want to ensure that our scholars are having this collaborative conversation and we're welcoming diversity into our classroom. It welcomes collaborative conversation. You're talking amongst each other in a respectful manner. Now, we're going to break this down. And how does that look in the classroom? Before, Because before we get to respectful matter, we still have to deal with the, the traditional approach of persuasive, you know, explaining, right? But argumentative writing is more of those three, you know, added as an equation, right, on steroids. And then you have the argumentative writing process. As I said earlier, it also supports the reading as I mean, the language, the listening and speaking skills. Right. And it, it encourages healthy dialogue. We want to ensure that we have healthy dialogue that's happening in our classroom. So those are the benefits out there. So let's get right into, you know, the different areas of argumentative writing. Do me a huge favor, man. I'm telling you, you have to write this information down and process it. Because once your scholars become proficient in the argumentative writing process, they'll be able to articulate and critically think on their own and have discourse with other people that don't look like them and hold their own. I promise you, it's a phenomenal approach, but it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of understanding. It takes the breakdown of a rubric, and it takes a lot of practice, okay? So here's the argument of writing rubric that I put together for you guys out there, okay? And I also have it here with the talking points. Number one, the first thing that you want to ensure that you have within the argument and writing process is the claim, which is your main argument, okay? They can ask you a question, okay? We can ask you a question um, just in regard to the, you know, coronavirus, right? I have students that are working on coronavirus. Um, I'm actually putting together the argument of writing um, um, question for, for my own student, my own kids right now, right? So you could just ask them some sort of essential question, open-ended question. And remember, the claim is just the main argument. The claim is the answer. Just get to the point. It's just a statement. You're just going to answer, right? Point blank, period. Okay. Next, you have the evidence. That is facts about the information. Okay. So once you have the claim, which can be your theme, which can be your main idea, right? If you want to put it in that perspective, the evidence is just the supporting details, right? When you look at the Common Core State Standards, before you have a theme, you can let everybody know here's the theme or here's the main idea, but you have to have some sort of evidence behind it, right? So what are your supporting details? Next, okay, make sure you guys are writing this down. You have the warrant, okay? So within a warrant, you want to ensure that you have the data to support that. Why the data supports the claim. Any claim you put out there, any evidence, and the evidence is coupled with the data. Make sure that you have that down, whether you're talking about charts and graphs, whether you're talking about reading bar graphs, whatever the case may be. You want to have some sort of data to back up everything you're talking about. That is your warrant. Next, again, you have the backup backing right that's any additional information right if you want to use those transitional words to continue the conversation around the warrant that's called your backing 
okay and i'm gonna show you guys how to put this together in a well precise way that's going to work phenomenally for your scholars in your classroom so again the backing is any additional information to support the warrant you just extending your explanation that's all you is okay that's all you're doing here is the critical component that we make sure that we have to make sure we instruct our scholars around that is the counterclaim right and we're going to talk about the counterclaim here in a second and okay, I'm going to break this one down, but that acknowledges others, but go back to your claim. OK, that's what the counterclaim is. And last but not least, hey, after you acknowledge somebody and gave them, you know, appreciation of what they're talking about, your rebuttal is evidence that disagrees with them. OK, it's like being in a, a, in a, in a court of law. Right. You know, and how you're going to have this conversation in a respectful way. And remember, we're analyzing speaking and listening standards, right? Your last point is the rebuttal. You give them the opportunity, you acknowledge what they're saying with the counterclaim. However, you rebuttal that with evidence that disagrees with them, as known as you have to make sure you do your research out there, educators, okay? Because they're going to hit you with a rebuttal. So you have to know everything they're talking about. I want you guys to really think about that, okay? Um, when we talk about the claim, the evidence, the warrant, the backing, man, that counterclaim is deep i'm telling you and that works in your classroom okay i remember i used to have scholars having this discourse right we used to put together these circle these centers um the socratic seminar centers right and i used to give them some sort of open-ended question question right and they had to you know basically debate in a respectful manner with each other i had to model those expectations because a lot of our scholars out there they're so opinionated they're so persuasive and they like to explain information you guys get where i'm going with this right so when they have somebody that disagrees with them, they become turned up like, no, nah, uh, 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 nope, that's wrong. I had to put out the fire so many times in the classroom when I introduced this, right? Because the counterclaim is tough because we have a lot of passionate people out there and we are passionate when it comes to education, especially in public education. Our black and brown students are passionate and when they believe in something, they're going to hold stern to it. But you had, I had to model this, right? And model how to agree to disagree. Like, you know what? I understand what you're saying, right? However, and use a respectful tra um, tradition, transitional words, because I had to take the word, the, the word, but out of their vocabulary. You know, I hear what you're saying, but you had to take that out because that's a total disagree and disrespect to them, right? You can say things in a respectful way. And what I had to model in front of my kids is that it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? So that transitional word is very, very, very much more. It's much, it's important, right? Let's just put it like that. It's very important um, that you use those transitional words. Also, it creates healthy dialogue, right? As I said before, you want to introduce the argumentative writing process so your babies can learn how to speak and listen in a productive way amongst people that don't look like them or don't come from their background. And it's okay to model how to agree and disagree, but do it in a way that scholars can own it. So when they're having conversations, they can say, I can see what you're saying, Johnny. Uh, however, I believe that blah, 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 because they're going back to their claim, okay? And they're going to show you evidence to support why your claim is wrong. That's the counterclaim. And they're going to do it in a respectful way. And after they're done, they're just going to smile. They're going to kill it with kindness, right? Because when you're looking at different, I'm always watching different uh, cases within a court of law, right? If I'm viewing television and entertainment, right? You always see them go back and forth. But it's never a demeaning way to say, no, you're wrong. This is what it is. No, you have to have collaborative conversation. And then everything that you're doing when in the midst of the argument of writing, you're making this a teachable moment. So I have to model that in front of my scholars to agree with what they say or disagree because they know that I'm a student of the game as well. So you guys have to understand that, okay? Here is the rubric. Here is the rubric. Guys, this is most critical component. You cannot teach anything without a rubric, okay? It's important. It's like you, it's like you, you know, basically asking to get paid, but don't get a check to show your hours and anything. You need to know a job description, right? You need to know what you need to do so you can be successful. Our babies need a rubric. So I was able to break down the rubric for everybody out there, okay? And I was able to take the Smarter Balance rubric, and you know they have the student friendly and teacher friendly. This is the understanding of the understanding. This is a student student friendly version. Okay, I wanted to make this more creative and cool for my babies out there and for you guys out there, so you can understand. And remember, I'm instructing this with a third grader as well as a kindergarten student. They are starting their argument of writing process. Both of my kids here at the house doing this remote learning session. Argument of writing rubric. I want you guys to write this down because I'm going to give you a, I'm going to provide you with some information 
that's going to support you as is in a teachable moment situation and what we need to do because sometimes as educators and i found this out actually researching this a couple of years how i have did my scholars in the past a disservice when i when it came to teaching writing and i'm gonna explain this to you guys in a minute the argument in writing process the first thing that you want to go through the scholars with is making sure that you know the difference between a four three two one and a zero OK, and when you go through a rubric, make sure that you teach them everything from a four standpoint. Don't teach them a one. OK, don't teach them a zero. Teach them a four and make sure you set the bar high with the four. So anything that comes under that, at least as a B or C, right? You don't want to teach the rubric by just going through. Hey, man, I'm going to start off with a three, man. This is how you can get a B. No, teach them the highest grade because you have expectations, right, for your babies. Number one, statement of purpose and focus. That's what you'll be graded on. That is the claim. We just talked about the claim, okay? They're going to give you an open-ended question, some sort of essential question, and the first thing you're going to write down is the claim. That's you basically answering the question, okay? Number two, organization. That is start to finish, okay? And I was able to take the Smarter Balance rubric, and I was able to put some of these um, some of these um, strategies in here that can support you when we talk about the organization. Make sure you have clear-cut transitional words. So spend some time with your scholars out there going over transitional words, you know, not the traditional to explain, comma, for example, comma. Give them some higher thinking, like transitional words, right? That can, that can make their writing more provocative, more enhanced, enhanced, right? And then number two, when you talk about organization, clear structure. Sometimes when we get into the writing, our babies are everywhere. That's because we're teaching them everywhere, okay? We have to ensure that everything is organized. You have to read their thoughts, right? And that's why I'm saying we have to practice this with having collaborate collaboration in the classroom. So when they're saying something that's not correct, if they're saying something that's off track, you need to always get back. What is your claim? What is your evidence? Go ahead and correct them. What is your claim and what is your evidence? Don't have your babies everywhere. Number three, elaboration of the evidence. With number three, that's basically your evidence, your warrant, and your backing all together. Remember, provide them with the evidence. Have a warrant and then have a backing. You want to have more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. And you want to start eventually moving your babies to, you know, having uh, literature reviews, right? Having other authors agree with them and being able to cite that information in an APA format. Think about that. You're going to take some sixth graders and I'm going to take my kindergartner and I'm taking my third grader and we're going to start the APA process early. Get them right early. It's cool. I'm telling you. And then I have number four and number five. And we're going to talk about number four and number five. OK, number four, number five. Number four is, trend, is language and vocabulary. OK, make sure you write this information down and inbox me if you have any questions, comments, concerns, because I want to be here to support you. And then number five is convention, spelling, punctuation. OK, as well as capitalization. Think of this analogy when we talk about the argument and writing process. OK, when I take my car into the and I take my car to this um, car wash called Buddy Bear for a lot of my Chicagoans out there, the people that live in the state of Illinois, you know what Buddy Bear is, right? You go get your car all nice and clean. Looks real good. Get it detailed, right? So there's the analogy when you want to connect the car wash to this, right? You take your car in one, two, and three, statement of purpose, focus, organization, and three. That's the basic car wash. Let me just get a car wash. You want to shine? No, I don't need no shine. Just wash my car. I want you guys to think about that. All you're doing for number one, two, and three is washing your car. You want to make sure it look, it's looking nice. They're, they're, they're cleaning the inside. You're cleaning the inside. Whatever the case may be. Number four and five, language and vocabulary as well as convention. That is you actually getting the polish on your car. Now, when they ask for the polish, they ask for a couple more dollars, right? And sometimes I'm like, I don't need a polish. I need my car wash. What we're doing in our classrooms, okay? And I want to put this up so you guys can see this, okay? What we are doing in our classes sometimes, we are focusing too much on four and five. We are telling students, nah, you don't sound right. Oh, no, that's not capitalized. Oh, your spell is incorrect. Oh, this is what you're doing that's wrong. What we are finding out in the in the field of education, especially when you're teaching the argumentative writing process, is that we are spending too much time on language and vocabulary and spelling the grammatical parts. That's the pet stuff. It's going to happen, okay? You cannot find yourself an intermediate as well as middle school doing spelling tests because what you are doing, unintentionally you are doing, I'm going to say that respectfully, you are prohibiting the creativity of your scholars. 
because they are saying to themselves, I can't write because I can't spell. I cannot write because I cannot capitalize that word. I don't know punctuation. You are spending your time with the grammatical parts and you are excusing the other portion. And that's the creativity, the claim, the evidence. What you should be doing, think about this, okay? Write this information down. 90% of the time, okay? And I'm going to put these different areas that I got from the rubric up here for you guys out there. 90% of your time should be on statement and purpose, focus, organization, an elaboration of evidence. I don't care what spells right. I don't care the transitional words. I don't care if you sound crazy, but this is your creativity. I am going to build your skill set around these three areas. Statement of purpose, focus, organization, elaboration of evidence. Once you have that put together, now I'm going to do a shine it up. Let's shine it up. Let's go. Now you're going to teach them how to edit. Now you're going to go through the grammatical parts, right? You're going to take it and enhance it. So we should not be starting the argument or writing process off, process off with four and five. Language in vocabulary, you're going to spend the bulk of your time going over vocabulary. I'm just going to teach vocabulary all day. <laughs> okay. The vocabulary is going to happen through the reading excerpts, through the close reading, right? Through the rigorous tasks that you give them. The vocabulary is going to happen because they need to know how to annotate and go through that. But you should not have a separate entity where you're just teaching vocabulary by yourself in isolation. You should teach reading. Remember, reading and writing go together. Whatever I can comprehend, I should be able to let you know without even telling you vocally. I should let you know that through writing it out. I show my comprehension by writing, okay? You should not spend a bulk of your time going through language and vocabulary as well as conventions, okay? Spend majority of your time going through one, two, and three. Statement of purpose, focus, organization, elaboration of evidence is very, very critical. Listen, this is argument and writing 101. And not only can you apply this to reading, you can apply this to science. The next generation of science standards, please inbox me. Guys, you know that's my area of support. I love science, okay? I focus and love science, okay? Make sure that you inbox me, whether we're talking about social justice issues, whether we're talking about Project 1619, whatever we're talking about is social studies, make sure you inbox me. I can support you. You can utilize the argument and writing process within any form of the curriculum. But most importantly, you want to ensure when your babies graduate, they can hold their own and have conversations with people that do not look like them that come from a different subgroup. That's the argument of writing process. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Okay. I've missed you guys so much. We are back at it every single Saturday at 9 a.m. I am bringing the heat. Okay. Breaking the education code, the instructional guide for enhancing teacher capacity while increasing scholar achievement. Please go to my website at larueandfish.com. The book is out. Make sure that you inbox me uh, for that support. If you need help, this remote learning is unforeseen circumstances at this moment. If you need help with basically small groups through Google Meets, you want me to help you break down the data, you need intervention support, you want to learn how to analyze data, you want to make sure you can look at the RIT band with NWEA and provide them with the supports. If you want to go through the goal setting process, but more importantly, if you're looking for leadership opportunities and you need coaching support, please make sure that you inbox me, okay? I want to be here to work with you. And not only just teachers out there, parents, because guess what? You are the co-teachers at home, especially if you're working with kindergarten first and third, second, because I told you, my son Josiah, I'm working with that teacher, okay? And we're having conversations. So if you need help with co-teaching, because I'm noticing that a lot of our schools and districts across America are still using a traditional report, report uh, approach, excuse me, when we talk about providing students with those supports, when we talk about IEPs and we're only giving them services only in reading and math, and we're not really doing it well, and then we're still letting them push into the general class for social studies and science, and that's not really the current up-to-date practice. When we should be intentional. IEP is an individualized educational plan so we can so we can coach and build capacity and set a meaningful goal, not just with a writ goal for our scholars, but more of a goal after you analyze the data since they've been in school so they can matriculate and grow out of their IEP. A student should not have an IEP for the rest of their lives. Okay, so if you need any of those supports, 
continuous improvement work plan, school improvement plan, whatever you need, please make sure you're, inbo you're inboxing me. I want to make sure I'm supporting you. I am here. I am here working with you, and we're going to do this together. Again, go to my website, LaRueMFish.com, or inbox me directly on Facebook. You guys have a wonderful, productive weekend. Stay blessed. I'll see you next week. Next Saturday, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, please share this link with somebody out there and please welcome them to the fold. We're going to have a nice conversation next week. You don't want to miss this. Have a blessed one. Peace.